You're listening to the Nerd to Know Media Network. Join us at nerdtoknowmedia.com. Broadcasting from the Blanchistan Center. This is Phoenix FM. The internet is a communications tool. Use the world over where people can come together to pitch bad movies and share pornography with one another. According to the Nerd Index, you should be upside down in a junior high toilet around the clock. This is the Well, good luck! Tide goes in, tide goes out. Never miss communication. It's over 9,000! My name is Foxy. The balls are in there. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of the Nerd to Know Basis Show. My name is Kieran Calicorn and with us as always is, introduce yourself. Ahoy, I'm Daryl O'Connor. Ahoy hoy. Ahoy. And uh, thank you so much for finding time in your busy schedule. Uh, Just a little behind the scenes info. August is a very busy month for the Nerd to Know team. I know usually half a dozen of us are all competing over each other to get voices in. So we're going to have some guests on in the next few weeks. Keep an eye on the socials for who. Uh, we had the wonderful host of Land Parties, Lucas Egan, on last week. Uh, and there's going to be more to come. But in the meantime, let's hear from the boss himself. Dara, how are you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I just want to add to that as well. One, Keen, thank you so much for booking those guests. You know, I, I'm in the middle of finishing a master's in cybersecurity <laughs> and it sucks. It's so much work. <laughs> it's so much work. It's ridiculous. Um, so I do appreciate Keen, you know, picking up the ball there and doing it. And here's the thing. If you guys want to join in, if you have a podcast, if you're a listener, or if you're just a massive nerd and want to talk about something, nerdsnomedia at gmail.com. Shoot us an email. Go, hey, I want to be on the show. And then we'll set it up. <laughs> exactly. Can't be, yeah, more can't, can't be more fair than that. Exactly. I mean, let's just reiterate that we are a community of like... Um, what would you call yourself? A sort of cybersecurity guy. We have like a drama teacher, a Pokemon slash ghost expert, someone who makes jewelry and body paint, three people who work in bookshops. Like it's it's an eclectic mix. Don't but, think you won't fit in. But no, you know, like like uh, Phoenix FM is a community radio station as well. So, you know, the, the whole point of this podcast is to be your community hub for nerd stuff you know and if there is a say you want to be on it or if you have like you know what i really liked about katie show was she would um she'd bring out these guests you know and you'd never hear of them before but they'd be in the community and i thought that was really cool so you know if if there is someone who wants to do that they're like oh hey i run a small business or you know i have a comic or making a game or something reach out to us you know honestly like it's it, it's something we're going to try to do a little bit more now that finally the tech issues have been resolved we're able to go back live again but also you know after august i'll be relatively free so we'll be able to kind of go back into it and really you know push ahead on this and look we're facing the barrel we're facing down the barrel of another lockdown so i think we're going to be making a lot more content <laughs> always the optimist well sure We've got plenty of time to talk about lockdown stuff, but I'm quite eager because you mentioned right before recording that you, you have seen the new Suicide Squad movie, confusingly not called Suicide Squad 2. But how and ever, how did you find it? Well, look, I'm not going to go and get into spoilers and such. Um, I don't really need to. Like, it's uh, it's interesting. Like, it's the Suicide Squad, which is a weird like it's not a it's not a sequel. But it kind of is. But it's a reboot, but not really. And what I mean by that is, it's like, they try to have the cake and eat it too by having sequel elements in it. Then they completely undo that and then go a different direction with it. But you're still like, this really feels like a sequel, but it's not. So, you know, I'd say, look, if you haven't seen Suicide Squad, don't. Um, (laughs) Oh my God, you didn't enjoy it. 
No, no, the first one. Sorry, the first. Oh, one. the first one. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, gotcha, yeah. gotcha. Okay. So if you've seen, if you have, if you haven't seen Suicide Squad, don't watch it. It's it's there is right. literally no point to watch the first Suicide Squad movie, right? Okay. Um, but if you if you haven't seen this one, go see it. It's a lot of fun. Like genuinely, it's it. The problem with the first one, I mean, you know, I, there will be spoilers for the first one because it's like what it's four or five years old. It's like if you haven't mm-hmm. seen it now, I'm like I'm sorry. Um, your know, problem with that was it never. The threat wasn't wasn't met appropriately. So mm-hmm. basically, the plot of the first one, as you know, was like this witch goddess who you know was causing problems. I'm like, okay, why are they sending Harley Quinn, who's a, who who is just a person, a crazy person, mm-hmm. a man who throws boomerangs, who are just boomerangs, and other such things? After this, you send superheroes. You you send. The Flash, you send Batman. Batman's not really a superhero, but you know he'd fi- figure it out. Yeah. Superman is dead, I think, at that point. Um, you know, Which, or Shazam. Yeah, it's a ring of itself because you've got two layers of they're creating the squad in case Superman goes evil, who yeah. is dead. Yeah. And at the same time, you have in the movie Enchantress is recruited to the Suicide Squad for the reason that in case Superman goes evil, and yeah. then she turns on. The, so it's a it's a threat they created for themselves, but the movie never addresses it. Look, it's, en- it's... En- Enchantress is like the Suicide Squad were always designed for black ops, right? Yeah. And that made sense. And you're like, cool. And that's and what I mean is like in this movie, it's a black ops oper- operation that they're doing. And it like makes way more sense. It's like, okay, I can buy this. You know, even though Harley Quinn is there and she is there for she's there because she's Harley Quinn and people really like her. But she does actually serve a purpose in the movie and it is you know she is like not the best part of the movie but she is really enjoyable um but like the whole thing kind of comes off more not believable because the end of it you know is ridiculous but uh, it's like it's more appropriate that's the word i'm looking for the whole movie is more appropriate and more tonally consistent so like and they'll have their their threat and they send in the, the the black ops groups, and then it kind of goes from there. And you're like, okay, this actually makes way more sense, and it's a world I can get behind because I'm like, my whole time I'm not like, where's Superman? Where's Shazam? What's going on? <laughs> Except at the end, the end of it when they do what they do, the same problem happens. It's like, there's no way Superman isn't watching it going. I have to go do something. You know, right. I, I can't just stand here and like let that happen. And that's the problem when you have Superman in these movies because you're like, or not, he's not in the movie, obviously, but yeah. I mean, in the world, it's like, he's not just going to sit there and let it happen. He's going to come and do something, you know? And that's the problem. Like with the black operations, um, when they just have a focus to that, it's like, well, he's not really going to care because it's like, it's not really that big of a deal, you know? But when they start introducing threats that are beyond your average, and they do call them metahumans, but it's still at the end of the day, like, you know, the threat at the end of the movie is just ridiculous thing. And you're like, mm. come on, there's, there's no way, you know. Well, um, can I interrupt there? Because I, I this is by James Gunn, uh, who yeah. did The Suicide Squad. And, you know, his movies involved a five, four or five unpowered people taken on a living planet and that kind of works so what is it about this film with ostensibly it sounds like similar stakes for the bigger super duper villain and you know a shark what is it that doesn't gel well with you in that regard for this one? Oh no it does gel like it's a very 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 good movie mm. but the problem with it is the reason why it gels in the first part of the movie and almost up to the very end is the reason why it doesn't gel afterwards. Right. But, okay. Slight spoilers. So at the end of their main mission, they discover that there's this intergalactic thing. There's this massive big kaiju. And then it gets unleashed. That's beyond the pay grade of Harley Quinn and a shark. Yeah, which is peculiar and, because birds they, of prey exists and they had the scales kind of correct in terms yeah, of the like, match up there, you know. That's it. Like birds of birds of prey makes sense because it's like, okay, it's a low level 
you know, even with Batman, like you would not see Batman fight a kaiju because mm. he'd be like, I can't fight that. I'm gonna call Superman. <laughs> You know, it's like that's what yeah. you do. You know, or I mean, he'd not. try. He'd I'm try. sure, but yeah, but he wouldn't. He'd realize this. I don't need to do this because yeah. Superman is there. This is what they do, and they've also. I'm thinking about this is post Justice League, so the, the Justice League exists. Hmm. You know, it's like, can you? And it, and here's the thing. They also say that it's um the show on TV, hmm. so it's on TV. <laughs> and no one is watching it going, we should probably go and fix that, lads. Yeah. You know, it's like, it, it's just, it's kind of ridiculous. But that being said, tonally, this was brilliant. Um, It was a lot of fun. James Gunn does a really good job. It's like Guardians of the Galaxy. It really feels like a more violent Guardians of the Galaxy. Like it is, exce- it is excessively mm. violent. Um, But in, it's fun. Um, the cast is really good. Ages Elba is amazing. I really like Ages Elba. I always have, but I think he works way better in this than he has in like as uh, Heimdall. He just did wasn't a good Heimdall in Thor. Um, well, he wasn't given a lot to do. In fairness, he wasn't. Like, uh... No, he wasn't. But even in Ragnarok, he wasn't very good. But he's very good in this. Um, your your mates in there. Um, the man who made that train wreck. Oh, Thor movie. Oh, Taika Waititi. Yeah, he's in it, and he plays a drug a drug, a drug addict. Um, My mate. That, it's fun. I thought you were gonna say Peter Capaldi. Peter Capaldi is in it, and he's actually a lot of fun. Um, well, can I ask then? Because this is the aspect I'm most curious about. The cast for this movie is huge yes. and all notable, and I know yes. we're living in a post End Game world where like millions of people can be in these movies but how does the movie do a job of juggling all these characters and giving them space to grow and all do this you... kind of stuff okay well then we're gonna get into spoilers so if you want me to talk about it we are gonna have a half a spoiler section is that all right um all right listeners well like just come back in like four minutes maybe well i'll keep an eye on the track then yeah yeah okay so they kill loads of people right <laughs> <laughs> so that's how they do it they just kill them all off not all everyone, not everyone. But right, well, I mean, that's not a huge spoiler because the, the entire conceit of the Suicide Squad comic was that one of them would die. Yeah, issue, it, you know? it, it, it's, it's, the, it's the conceit. And they actually lampshade it as well, going, you know, it's suicide. Mm. It's like, well, that's kind of our job. Yeah, I and mean, that, it was rough yeah. that only Slipknot, the man who can climb everything, died. And like, that's the entire point. They're, they're yeah. called the Suicide Squad because they're sent in to die. Yeah, so the movie opens up with the, the team in the last movie yeah. and they all die because it's a trap. Right. And throughout the whole course of the movie, the other team pretty much completely die, with the mm-hmm. exception. And even Captain Flag dies as well, which sucks, because uh, he's really good. The only person that lives is Harley Quinn. And that's it. Oh, and Age Zelpa. And that's it. <laughs> and you're like, all right, oh, sorry. I mean, like, the, of the notables, the, there are two others yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, survive, yeah. but I don't give everything away. But, like, yeah. it's just kind of, you know, that's how they balance it. They, but here's the thing. Mm. By killing them, they actually give them an awful lot of space to grow. Like, uh, Bo- Captain Boomerang dies, and he has more character growth and death than he ever did in life. Well, that's just it. You've got to, like, have stakes. Like, you know... Yeah, and... no, and that's it. And, and the movie does does actually have stakes. And stuff mm. happens that makes sense, and Peter Capaldi has a really funny death. Um, but it's... But it makes sense. It's like, it's all... It's not, it's not coming out of nowhere. Um, yeah. I think the, the good thing about this is James Gunn is kind of his hands are not tied by a larger Marvel story. There he can right. just kind of do what he wants because all this is going to be wiped very soon anyway. Like all of this is going to so be wiped. It's, so it's a self-contained, it can do what it wants kind of thing. Yeah, like it's like it's so like it, it's it's fixed, right? Like as far as they're able to do X, Y, and Z. But he's able to do a lot more because as soon as Flashpoint happens, mm. all of this is being wiped anyway. So all of this is being garbaged. Or not garbage, but it's all being multiversed. So mm. they can kind of do whatever they want. So now if they did want to bring Captain Boomerang back, they can just be like, oh, it's a different version of Captain Boomerang. They brought Superman back. Well, actually, kind of moving on. Well, I would say, look, if you're a fan of the first one, you'll be mm. way more... Uh, way more satisfied with this Suicide mm. Squad. It's it's very good. It's a very good movie. Um, has some really good characters, some really good moments. It's very funny. 
Um, and look, I wasn't even upset that your man who ruined uh, Thor is in it, so we're fine. <laughs> but what what I will say is, uh, you know, there's also some more news on the DC thing before we jump into our next story. That uh, Ed, Ed, uh what's it, Miller? Aaron, what's the guy's name? Adrian Miller. Are you talking Ezra, about Frank? Ezra, Miller? Ezra, Ezra Miller. Guys oh, Flash, yeah. Uh, the bit turns out the main bad guy in in Flash is actually going to be a negative version of him, so it's going to be negative. Okay, what's the right like, oh, Flash thing to do? And I don't even know Flash. Yeah, well, it makes sense. You know, it, it's I, I saw some of the set photos, and it's all uh, in 1989 Batman. Right. So it, they have the, like the car and stuff, and I'm just sitting there going, "Oh my god, this okay. is so cool!" Is there any update on when that Batman film's coming out? But by the way, your four I... minutes are up for spoilers and Suicide Squad. Ah, sorry, right. we're there, done. We're is done. there any update on when the Batman film with Robert Pattinson's coming out? Oh, I have no idea. I have no interest in that. Um, <laughs> the, the good one, I think, is 2022. <laughs> I have no interest in that movie. I have absolutely no interest. Here's the thing. It's like, he refuses to get in shape. He refuses to do it. I'm like, what are you doing? Like, did you not see Ben Affleck? Did you not see how he could crush your skull? <laughs> you know? Did he? I've, I watched the wrong film. <laughs> Dude, Ben Affleck built like a you-know-what house because it's just, you know, he's the most legitimate Batman I've ever seen on screen. Well, well, Batman's a character who, even if he can't, like fight Thor, he's clever enough to kind of get around. That's his kind of thing, you know? I mean, it Michael is. Keaton isn't it Arnold Schwarzenegger-like. No, but Michael Keaton is still imposing. Mm. You know, he, he still has that, you know... Uh, Robert Patterson doesn't have that. And he does look... I'm not saying he needs to be built like mm. like Thor, but mm. he needs to do some push-ups and some sit-ups. Cause, like, literally, that's what... That's what Batman does. You know, he's mm. his mind is obviously, you know, was he has 52 master degrees and his, his body's at peak physical condition at all times. Um, and that's just standard, that's just Batman, even in the animated series. He would always be working out with judo or something like that, you know. So it's like you have to do something, Robert Parson. You can't just, you know, eat loads of cheeseburgers and be Batman. Come on. Like, I don't think work. I don't think he's gonna be like an obese Batman. <laughs> There's a middle ground, like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I, I like, for example, like with Spider Man, like it's, I don't know, I I'm not I'm not gonna hate on it because it's like there's, yeah. there's not enough for it to hate, but I will say from what I've heard, it's very concerning that he won't throw himself into the role 100. percent And you know, there's the going the other way as well with like Heat Ledger's Joker where he threw himself too much into it and went. Yeah, kind of nuts. yeah, that's a fair point. Um, but even even with uh Chris Christian Bale where he went off did the uh, Machinist, which is a great movie went down to literally a rake like it's actually terrifying like a skeleton and then bulked all the way back up to be a batman in three months my mace's heart didn't give out to be honest with you mm. but like that's the commitment to play batman and i just don't see it for, and i would i like robert parson i really liked him in uh in tenet i thought like, that's what won me over mm. his performance in tenet but i'm like you need to you know you can't half-ass playing batman you know you have to really go for it but i said i'm not excited about it i don't like year one anyway it's not a good mm. story uh, in my opinion and what we have seen we have seen a lot of year one in batman begins so i'm like yeah true yeah i'm like okay i've kind of seen this flashpoint is more interesting because it opens up the multiverse now it kind of it fixes all the dc problems and then kind of creates everything you know it allows them to like do certain things so they can do a Batman Beyond movie. They can do a Team Up movie. They can do a Rock of Ages. They can do all this kind of stuff. And it's like, okay, cool. You know, that's way more interesting than whatever else you're going to do. Because, like, I don't think Marvel's sequential storytelling works because people have bought into it and it's it's done. DC's storytelling has always had this problem, which is why they created the multiverse in the first place in the in the 40s. Um, was because they they would write they paint themselves at the corner. They're like, oh crap, what are we doing now? And this is like it's been staring them in the face the entire time. You know, they've always and they, they've done this where they've jumped around. They've done like the because like the Tim Burton Batman is not the same Batman as in Batman and Robin, but it's supposed to be. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it doesn't yeah. make any sense. Here's the thing though, if you're like, well, tier like yeah, fair enough, that could have happened, but. And here's what they're what they are doing is Michael Keaton's Batman has always been Batman since 1989. He never stopped being Batman. Mm. 
So that means after Batman Returns, he just kept going and another branch split off where it was um, the other guy, what's his name? His name escapes me now. Val Kilmer. Val Kilmer, thank you. Val Kilmer's Batman t- was took over and in that timeline, Val Kilmer's always been Batman. George Clooney's always been Batman. And I think that's a much more interesting way of doing it because it's like, you can just go back to these guys and go, hey, what's, what's, what's up? What's been happening? So like, in some in some continuity, Christian Bale is still Batman. In another continuity, he's not Batman. He's in Italy. In another continuity, he's dead. In another continuity, yeah. do, do, do well, then you're the kind of alluding to the question I've been waiting to ask, which is that surely, even though this applies to Marvel too, surely once you've opened a multiverse, sure it lets you tell any story you want, but doesn't it also diminish the stakes? Being that, like, oh, if Batman dies, there's 15 other Batmans out there. Like, I mean, yeah, Loki dies, there's lots of other Lokis. Like, how, how can you get invested in something which is infinite, you know? Well, see, that's the thing. Like, I think in Marvel's case, they're going to have to fix it, which mm-hmm. is what they are going to do. In DC's case, it's just how the comics are. Yeah, I think that's why I always had trouble investing in DC. I could pick up individual stories and like it. That's what you're like supposed I to do. I read Neil Gaiman's The End recently, which is brilliant. But that's what you're supposed uh, to do. That's okay. The whole, that's the whole, like, this is the thing that people don't understand. And I can't believe DC or Warner Brothers are sitting there going, we need to make this continuity. I'm like, do you not understand how your prof- how your properties work? That's yeah. not what happens. <laughs> you know, it's like Marvel's, and here's, people don't even realize this. Marvel's comics ran unbroken mm. for about what 60 70 years up until they reboot started rebooting them and started. like the Spider-Man continuity was only broken a couple of years ago and there was the so thing uh no 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 that was a different thing that was still all part of the continuity they actually okay. restarted the amazing Spider-Man from like one like four or five years ago but that's why they did the Ultimates in the 2000s. So no, they it's new and not yeah. interrupt. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, you're yeah. Right. yeah, you're right. But that didn't break the continuity. They actually yeah, but that's it. what I'm saying. You're yeah. right. They kept exactly. a, a straight through line. Yeah. You're right. The good part of like 50 odd years, like, you know. I, and that's the thing. And that's why the Marvel's approach works because those characters are designed to work that way. Mm. DC stuff was never designed to work that way. And what happens is, and what, what happened and happens is some guys grow up with the multiverse. The current writers go, we need to get rid of that. It's a joke. Right. And then they, the, the kids who love the multiverse go up and bring it back. And that's why there's six or seven crises. Crises. Is crisis. Is because, <laughs> because it's like, that's what happened. And you read Grant Morrison's book, which is a wild, wild book, but you totally have to read it. Um, it's all like, it goes into these kind of things. And I just, for me, I'm okay with DC having these self-contained stories where, look, the stakes might not matter, but they matter at the time. You know, where it's like, yeah. I don't need this big overarching continuity. You know, you can just bring in characters who you're familiar with and they have a good story. Because here's the thing, it means something to them. So, okay, let's just take, what do you say? One bat- so just say Batman dies, right? <laughs> Batman dies. That's going to mean something anyway, even if... <laughs> he doesn't come back or if another Batman comes back. You know, it, it's all relative. Like, I think the, the biggest problem with Loki was they diminished the, the Affinity Stones, but they don't realize that there is only one timeline where that matters and yeah. Kang the Conqueror is beyond that. There's no one really beyond that in the DC universe. There's no, like, there's no Kang in the DC universe. There's no Well, one... actually, I'm glad you brought that up because uh, you mentioned, like, you know, in Suicide Squad that, like, you know, it doesn't make sense that Superman da, 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 doesn't show up. I think Marvel has been incredibly clever to kind of, for lack of a kinder word, segregate its superheroes into different parts of the universe. So, yeah. like, the Loki stuff can happen and the Falcon can not notice, and that makes sense. Well, of course if you wouldn't notice. have to take and eat it too, that kind of He's thing. Just... He's just a guy. But that's what I'm saying, though. You know, like, like, you know, he, he has his own problems. The WandaVision stuff can happen. Thor, sure, he's off in space somewhere. It's fine. The universe is big enough that things can happen and not everyone and their mother will notice and come running, you know. But they have their own... This is what I'm trying to get to. Like, that's a very good point. This is what I'm trying to get to, you, right? The Marvel continuity, because it's always been interconnected, is se- segregation is a good word. 
it's segregated into spheres. Mm. So like what happened, you could, like even Black Widow, like you can have your spy thriller that goes on. And it's the most important thing in the world to Black Widow until the Red. Yeah, Ring. yeah. But really, that doesn't matter because Loki's resetting the entire thing off at the end of the universe. You know, it's like, of course, he's going to be a deal because he's a god. You know, it's like theoretically in Guardians of the Galaxy 2, they already told you that none of this matters because ego can just end the world if he wants to. Yeah. You know, so it's like, you know, Thanos is a weird one because like Thanos really shouldn't have mattered that much. And Thanos actually failed because they were too busy. Like the only reason why the Avengers lost was because they fought themselves. That was the only reason why. Well, you've kind of gotten to the heart of what, at least to me, seems different about Marvel and DC. Marvel is very character-led, and what happens to its characters and its continuity matters. But in DC, like, and the stakes in Marvel, like you say, Black Widow, are epic because they matter to the character, not because yeah. they matter to the world. Whereas exactly, in DC, yeah. every villain is a Thanos-level villain because you're dealing more with characters as epic concepts and as characters with personality, do you know what I mean? Like, well, that's it. Like, with um, DC is all based around archetypes, which is why mm. that's you know, the one. Yeah. Ha- having your multiverse thing works because you know, so once you bring Superman into it, it's very, very hard to beat Superman because he's Superman, mm. you know, it's like it's very <laughs> difficult to do, you can't really do it, you know, it's it's very difficult. Shazam the same. Yeah, he might be a kid, but he's still Shazam. Yeah. You know, like the only thing that's and even Batman, like enough time and prep Batman can be anybody. So it's not re- it's never actually a fair fight, you know. Mm-hmm. Um no matter But I suppose to kind of circle back to your thing, in order to justify a world where this many powerful people exist, almost every single thing that comes along has, has to, to happen be big enough. To, do you know what I mean? But it also has to happen. Scale. So it has to ha- so every single thing that could happen has to be able to happen. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. So like you know, um, Rock of Ages has to happen at the same time as Red Zone has to happen at the same time as Flashpoint has to happen yeah. at the same time, you know, as Watchmen. It has to all link in together because other than that, it falls apart. You can't have these stories that all link together because at some point you're going to break your continuity. Because yeah. here's the thing, like on Injustice, they're going to do an animated series on that, and it also goes into it as well. Where it's like, yeah, of course, eventually a fascist dictatorship run by Superman would happen because it's Superman, mm-hmm. and yeah. it, you know, it, he's, he's always on that line anyway. And if there is just somebody who was raised a little bit wrong or something really bad happens, which happens in Injustice, you know, he goes mad and he's like, Well, I can just rule these like a god, you know. But well, it, it, but, but I mean, it, to come back to that word you're using, archetypes, that's why the boys and the Invincible, which we talked about in previous episodes, like they latch on to particular DC characters yes. because, like yes. you said, they are symbols rather than Character. Peter Parker has his Aunt May, has, which is incredibly specific. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Well, that's it. Like, with, um, so, it, look, look, it's very hard to have a story of a, of a god and change it mm. all the time. Like, you, even with Norse mythology, or, you know, pick any mythology you want, right? You can't really, like, change it too much because then it breaks the entire thing, right? You can't just, you, you know, they try, they try to do this even in Roman mythology. Um, they would, you know, make up fan fiction for themselves, right? <laughs> this is true, but <laughs> they would do it. And they make up fan fiction based on Greek mythology. And they would actually do this thing where they'd split off and tell their own story that's happening parallel to something else. So it doesn't contradict. Are you what talking happened. about in classical Greek and Roman culture I'm now? T- exactly. Yeah. So. In- oh, yeah, of course. Sure. Greek like, you know, theater is born into the fact that people would turn up and they would invent three tragedies and one comedy about the same characters and the most popular ones stuck like DC comic books. Like, exactly. you know. Yeah. And uh, you know, here's the thing. Comic books are just our modern mythology. We're telling mm. the same stories. They just have capes this time. Yeah, yeah. And that's a very good way of putting it. You know, and, and it, it when you do kind of look at it that way, you have to really understand what you have. Like, Mar- as you said, Marvel stuff is character driven. Marvel stuff is all about struggle. And, you know, even the, you know Jack Kirby and uh, Stan Lee would talk about this all the time. It's like they're telling very small stories. It's why they all happen mm. in New York, because they were from New York. Like, 
Peter Parker is the perfect example of it. It's like, yeah, he technically is a metahuman, but he still has to go to school. He still has a girlfriend. He still has, you know, money troubles and stuff like that. The Fantastic Four are family. Yeah. That's that's what they are first. Then they're metahumans. In DC, you're a metahuman first. So it's the same properties inverted. And actually, you're right, because uh, I was rereading this book called The Science of Supervillains. And in it, like, Stan Lee had a very particular mandate to Spider-Man writers, yeah. which is that when you're writing a story where Spider-Man fights the vulture, yeah. the sp- like Peter Parker should be more concerned about his aunt paying the rent than he yeah. should be about beating the villain, because That's those it. stakes are more prevalent. You know? but, al- but also it means that like the story there isn't really... The story there isn't really the supervillain. It's about the problem he's overcoming and the supervillain just happens to be part of it. And this is what the MCU yeah, exactly. gets. This is what the MCU gets over everything else. Like, you know, the reason why it struggles and it has actually one of its identifiable weaknesses as well. It's why when you say, oh, the villains kind of suck in Marvel. It's like, yeah, because they defeat them. Yeah. Definitively. That's yeah. not what happens. Like there's- like that's not yeah. There's I, actually I wrote a, I wrote a thing about this on Geek Garden. There's a very particular reason that Marvel movies always create villains that are just dark versions of the superhero. It's because they're supposed to embody struggles and things that the character is overcoming. Again, it's not a coincidence that Black Widow's villain is the concept of women being sold essentially into slavery. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Because that's a part of her backstory. Well, here's one for it's you. It's all right? designed to get that reaction, you know. Well, here's one for you that actually breaks that fundamentally for for the best, mm-hmm. right? Zemo. Ah, they, Zemo is the inversion. Yeah, well, he is like if you that you're getting into Civil War and Infinity War, where the writers, I think, Marcus and McFeely, I think. I got their names, hope I got their names right, where they wrote their movies and possibly Winter Soldier 2 with the villains as the protagonists. Well, see, here's the thing, right? With the reason, like the reason why Zemo sticks around is like the same with um the same with um Loki. Mm. You know a rose gallery a, a rose gallery is popular. And sp- the cool thing about Spider-Man now being more open with things is you know the vulture still exists. He's just hanging out in prison. We know that yeah. the scorpion is there. Uh, the, see, they killed off Mysterio, which is really annoying because he's not supposed to kill them. That's that or makes... did they? Because well, he's a master of illusions. Well, that's it. You know, it's like I think and the, the Red School is still around. This is this is what gives them their depth and like gives them challenge over and over again. Now I know some people are like yeah, but then it gets really tiresome. It's like well, write better. <laughs> no, because these have existed for 50 years and it's never really yeah. been a problem without killing them like kill uh killmonger they're probably going to bring back and they actually are, are bringing back in in well, the uh, what if, what yeah, if. Yeah, yeah. but killmonger shouldn't have died <laughs> they shouldn't have killed killmonger because he was a great villain he was the only good thing well I, I i would disagree with you there i think the fact that killmonger dies and you feel bad about it is the point because it validates his struggle Do you know what I mean? I yeah think but it's then- also but then yeah, you... same with Zemo, you know, it's yeah. you can't just kill him or you can't just put him in jail if the reason he's there has a degree of integrity. Do you know what I mean? Well, here's the thing. As soon as they killed Killmonger, Black Panther's entire reason for existing is invalidated. There was no there's not like there's no reason to have a Black Panther too. Like, what are they going to talk about? They've done well, everything. I mean, you've got... Actually, I'm excited for Black Panther, too, because you have five years on. Essentially, the second they decided to open the borders, Thanos turned up yeah. and wrecked the place. So you have a either a more global Wakanda or you have one that wants to kind of go Brexit and go more retroactive. So I think there's actually a huge scope for storytelling there. Yeah, well, there is, but not not with Black Panther. That's that's world building. That's a TV no, but show. they have established that the Black Panther is a mantle and not a person. I know, so and it's, and, and, and it's going to go that way. Yeah, it's going to go to Shiri, which is fair, obviously. But what I mean is, like, with that kind of stuff, by killing your villain, like, okay, let me let me walk this back. Cool. If Chadwick Boseman, if Chad, uh, T'Challa, uh, Chadwick Boseman was still alive, I yeah. don't think there would ever be a reason to do a Black Panther two because all of his arc has been done. He's he's right. uh, consolidated his kingdom. He's won it back. He helped defeat Thanos he doesn't have anything else he can really and he did the outreach obviously to the black communities in America so like what else can he possibly do that he hasn't already done 
and that's what I mean. Like you need to have these villains. Like Thor's story isn't done because he's off living for himself now, right? But his story's almost done, which is why they're bringing in Jane to carry it on, right? Um, and I think Thor is quite an interesting character in a sense that he started off being very generic, and now he's really well developed. Tony Stark, like, look, I love Iron Man. I love Iron Man, right? There's no reason for Tony Stark to come back. There's no reason. He's done yeah, I, I everything. Agree. I actually hope he stays gone. Like, th- no, no disrespect to him, but I just don't want them to take the weight out of his death. You know yeah, I mean? like, there's no reason for him to come back. Like, what else is he going to do? Like, th- there really isn't. You know what I mean? And this is what I mean. Like, when they when they kill their villains, and it and it is like, they can kill some of them, right? But when they kill their yeah. definitive vision, uh, 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 villain, as you said, it's a mirror of themselves. So they've overcome that issue. So what I think when when they're what Marvel needs to do going forward is when they have these stories, use your lower tier villains and kill those, or else defile the plot. But don't just kill them because then you're left with nobody. And it's the same, it's the same problem that went through the first Marvel movies where you're like, Oh, that was a cool idea. He's gone now. Okay. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I mean, well, like, just because actually, funnily enough, I've got a Lego Iron Monger looking at me on my desk. Like, you know, how cool would it be if you had, you know, Jeff Bridges sticking around trying yeah. to be the industrialist in a post Thanos world? I'd cool. love to explore dark elves, even though they're unpopular, find out what this was like. But even Doctor, the but, Big Bang. But even, but even Doctor Doom. Like, this is this is why when they do bring him, I really hope. They don't kill him in one because he should just be around all the time because he has diplomatic immunity. They won't. They, he's they, he's their he's their Thanos after Kang. They're definitely well, holding on to him. He's for, not a like, Thanos villain though. He's not a Thanos villain. He just he just runs a country and he's kind of nuts. You know, he's not. Oh, he a just runs a country. Okay, I know that. <laughs> I, I look. I love Doctor. I get you. No, I, I get you. He's Doom. not. He's not cosmic, but I get what you mean. But yeah, no, yeah. He, he's not trying to but end the again, world. He's, he's just trying to control it. Like He's not trying to end it. You know, that's the thing. And that's why I'm like, if you kill No, him- but to cycle back to your point, this this is where Zemo comes in. Because yeah. if you can have Zemo and Loki be ambiguous exactly, enough yeah. and likable. Yeah. Like, for example, Doctor Doom can do magic, which puts yes. him in Doctor Strange. He can do yes. science, which puts him in, I don't know, Ant-Man. Fantastic he can Four. be political, which puts him in Black Panther. So yep. I can see him being the next Thanos thing that kind of brings them all together, you know? Well, I can see him as somebody who's always just kind of there as one of the chessboard. Because remember, like, the mutants are coming, mm. right? And that's a much bigger oh, issue. There's a... That's a, that, yeah. that's a much bigger issue. Because the thing about it is, is like, Doctor Doom doesn't really... like. His main concern is is Laferia, right? So he just likes to be there, and mm. he obviously wants to kind of control the world eventually. But the mutants are trying yeah. to; they're a much much more hostile approach to it. And then we also have right. Zemo as well, who wants to get rid of all the super soldiers. So does that mean mutants? You see, that's what I mean. Like they they can kind of go anywhere they want. But the important thing going forward, and one thing that like you know, I know I said I was done with the MCU, and for the most part, if it does play out. In, in, in this way where they kill the villains, I will lose interest in it. But what I think was interesting now with this multiversal cosmic madness thing, they have the opportunity to have their cake and eat it too by going, right, well, who do we want to have? How do we want to have them? And how do we want this world to run? Because the thing about it is, even when the comic fad does die off, mm. the Marvel formula works so well that they could just tell these stories forever. But the thing about it is, they'll have to do the, like after Infinity War, they had to do this reshuffle because they've already went as big as they can go. They can't go any bigger without it being ridiculous. So they have to kind of do this reset. And what I would say is, if I was planning this out now, because here's the thing: Marvel now are, is not Marvel two thousand and eight. Marvel two thousand and eight wasn't even Marvel two thousand and eight, right? It was just an idea and a gamble. Now they can play out the next 20 years of movies with all their pieces. And I think they're going to do a really good job of it. Like for, from what I've seen with, with Loki, their world is so deep now that they're like, right, we can co- kind of go anywhere. And I really hope when they start bringing, when they start, you know, really bringing in the X-Men and that, that we're like, right, well, you know. Oh, also, you know, before we move on, uh, Ryan Reynolds really wants to have um, Mobius in Deadpool. Which would be great. <laughs> just imagine, imagine Moby's just showing up, and then Ryan Reynolds just like having a great time. But I think it'd be amazing. I think it'd be so good. 
that needs to happen. And he might give him a jet ski then. He might have turns up with his jet ski. Yep. Yeah, <laughs> okay, well, speaking Actually, of... Actually, I... Um... I was going to say, speaking of Doctor Who shows, big news broke in. How do you feel about the whole <laughs> Doctor Who news? <laughs> in the time we have left. Can I just ask, how do I sound? Because I'm sounding a bit robotic on my end. Am I sounding okay? You sound great. Okay, cool, fine. Yeah, it's... um. So, for anyone who may have missed it, um, they, first of all... In, since the last episode, they had their big Comic Con thing, uh, where they announced what the next series is about, and then briefly after that, they announced that both Jodie Whittaker and Chris Chibnall are leaving. Which I mean, I know he's not well liked. Jodie Whittaker is mostly. I find it a bit of a cause for concern because that means that, in the most technical sense, Chris Chibnall is the first showrunner to not preside over two doctors. And based on Joe Martin, the other doctor being introduced, I think he was planning to terrible. have two doctors. So I I don't know. I'm worried about the state of affairs. I'm doing an article for You're worried now. Ireland about now. You're worried now. <laughs> I I'm worried I in on, how long have I been saying on this show that it was terrible? It's well, funnily enough, I've been doing a bit of my and uh, um, people in the know will say, oh, classic who, like, it got its shot in the arm when it quaked that now, uh, 16 years, thereabouts. This is about the time Doctor Who was starting to get cancelled in the yeah. classic era. Yeah. So... I don't know. I yeah. I think Doctor Who's too big to fail at this point. It I could probably so. run for another ten years. No, I, I look. Yeah, it, it look as I said. Like even Star Wars isn't too big to fail. Like look at the damage that the the Rise of Sky. Like mm. those those horrible horrible movies did to the saga. Like yeah, they, compl- they damaged it beyond almost beyond repair. Yeah. If the Mandalorian had hadn't had come along, that the whole saga would be dead. Like dead, dead, dead. Like done. Not coming yeah. back ever. You know. And I think the Doc- Doctor Who for me, like, even though I didn't stick around as long as some people, um, it's just it's so bad, man. Like, so bad. Like, it's it's a bad, bad, bad show, and it doesn't have to be. That's the saddest part. Like, when I was watching Peter Capaldi, uh, actually, it's funny. There's a there's a Matt Smith in a another movie that looks really good. Uh, what you're one from, um, the Queen's Gambit, and I was like, oh man, I really, really miss Matt Smith. Yeah. And then, you know, watching Peter Capaldi, I'm like, he's actually really good. You know? And, uh, (laughs) you know, you're just sitting there going... Oh, yeah, they're they're stunningly talented. Yeah. But, like, with with Jodie Whittaker, like, I just... I I don't know if it was just her or if it was the writing, but it just never seemed good. It just seemed terrible. It's... Yeah, it's a funny one. Actually, funny enough, I watched a five-hour essay on this the other day because I just... (laughs) I like suffering. Yeah. I, I although it is very good. I I, I like the Johnny Whitaker era in general, but doing the maths on it, I I struggle to think of an original idea or take that it brought to the table. Now, as an experiment, I look Googled Peter Capaldi Doctor Who, and funnily enough, you can find a Guardian article for 2017 where people are bemoaning how bad the writing has become. So mm. I feel like in every era of Doctor Who, people are complaining about Doctor Who. I don't mind that. But I would say the weakness of this particular era is it hasn't brought much new to the table. Just taking the last era. Hasn't uh, even brought in fans. Stephen Moffat's run. I think well, that's much. just it. Like, I mean, I mean, don't get me wrong. The ratings and all that were in the toilet before Whitaker took over and spiked yeah. up, up a bit before going down when she came in but like it's you think on the last six years everyone on the internet was complaining about both matt smith and peter capaldi's tenure mm. but those, those eras brought in missy they brought in river song they brought in the silence and the ponds and loads of pe- things and people that really audiences did connect to the pattern oster gangs another one like mm. loads of really really imaginative stuff that stands to this era yeah. much as i liked the last two years there's nothing really. I'd struggle to think of like, oh, that's the thing. 
that's like, what this era is the, about. The only know? thing, the only thing that this era seems to be about is just a deconstruction of the the narrative or the mythos. Like they had the whole um, what was it? The something child. The timeless child. That was garbage. The timeless child. That was garbage here, and I'm like, what's the point of this? Like, we knew the doctor was a bad guy. I... Why, why, why are you doing this? Yeah. Like here's the thing. I don't mind that. I feel like that's a smoking gun I'm waiting to go on for ages, but if it yeah, but if it here's the thing, like I'm not against it. But it's not original. It's not see, that's the thing. It's not original, it doesn't lead to anything. Mm. They just did it to do it. You know, it's like they didn't they didn't it wasn't like a final build where you know the doctor is there and she's claiming like here's what would have been cool. If she had spent the whole time moralizing about how good she was and about how you know, she's figured everything out after all her lives and she's the best version of herself. And then that drop where it's like, well, you're not the best version of yourself. You were a child. And then, you know, you, you sold your power from her. That would be like, oh my God, that's so crazy, right? Nothing happened. It's literally yeah. like, they did it one week and then moved on. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay, that's it. You know, it's like, no, come on. Like, it's just... It's, yeah, yeah, I'm assuming they still have more to do with it. I'm, I'm, I, we're talking I about an unfinished story. Yeah. But, like, it's, I, I, it's, it's a tough one to call now. I would, it's funny, actually. I was with this era until I watched the Comic Con panel last week. Oh, wow. And it's, it, nothing. That's what nothing. happens. <laughs> they brought John Bishop on, who I mm-hmm. really like. They hyped up a special guest yeah. who uh, turned out to be uh, someone from Game of Thrones, who, you know, is good. But listening to them talk about it, they kind of talked about, oh, this series has monsters. It's so much fun to make. It's You compare that to the Comic-Con appearances hosted by Capaldi or Matt mm-hmm. Smith in the Ponds, where half of it was just them bantering about, you know, how much they love Doctor Who in the 60s, how exciting this thing was going to be. I can't believe we're going to get to see dinosaurs. And the thing that the check I did in my head was watching this newest one. Mm. Could this be a panel about Stranger Things if you just took out the words Doctor Who? And it yeah. probably could be. It's just they're very generically excited about well, the yeah. series. Well, how could you be excited about it? Like, legitimately, there's nothing to be excited about. It's like the new Star Wars films. It's like after... Mm. You know, I was like, we said this many times. Like, I wasn't excited at all about Rise of Skywalker when I. Oh God, me neither. When yeah, and we did a show about it actually a couple yeah. years ago. I tried to dig it out and post it on the socials. The the bingo thing we the, played. The bingo, yeah. yeah. When I was in London. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, we weren't excited about because we knew what was coming. You know, it it, yeah. it was nothing new. It was nothing fresh. It was just okay. We're it's it's vestigial and it's uh, procedural, and that's what Doctor Who yeah. has felt like. It's like. Okay, this isn't trying to tell a story. This is trying to either push something or, you know, just kind of hobble on. It's like, that's not fun. Nobody likes that. Like, for me, and I don't know if you're the same, but, like, I like my stories. And even good or bad, right? I like when something's really bad because at least they tried something. I like when something's really good because, you know, you celebrate success. But when something is just done to either push something or to, you know, just be the status quo, it's like, what's the point? Like, what is the point of Doctor Who? Like, it's like Star Wars. Without yeah. the Mandalorian, right? And even with the Mandalorian, what is the point of Star Wars now? Like, we know what happens at the end. It's not good. So, <laughs> what's the point? And it's like, you know, with Doctor Who, it's like, it's, what are you building towards, you know? It's, yeah, I, I, you are right. It's, it's a funny thing, actually, because I was trying to think, I never understood why the Moffat era wasn't popular. Yeah. But if I had to guess, yeah. I would say that it had so many ideas that were all competing for space and air, that it always felt like it was in a rush and wasn't fully developing things. You could have mm-hmm. done The Silence for three series. You could, you have. could have done River Song, Who Is She, for five years. You yeah. could have done Missy for 10 years. She's that good. Yeah. Whereas this era has the opposite. It hasn't got enough good ideas. So, no and don't get me wrong, there are great episodes there. I love The Haunting of Vildia Dati, the, the one set in the, in the Middle East. Not in the least in India. The, it are good episodes, but mm. those episodes exist as islands. They aren't yeah. part of a big fabric that's building towards something wonderful. Like you know, it's like I mean, when this new era starts, John Bishop. I love him. He's gonna. He's probably gonna be great. 
but he does feel like we're, you know, it's I, I keep waiting for the big thing the series is going to pull out of its sleeve to be amazing. And beyond the actors and like the special effects and the music being good, I, I don't get what this era is trying to accomplish. Do you know what I mean? Even and still, it's about it, to be over. But even still with the special effects and stuff like that, with increased budget, like I watched an episode and they were at a day spa. And I'm like, yeah. what the hell is this? Like, <laughs> what is this I, show is even orphan, about? Like, orphan 55. Actually, it's funny enough, I was thinking about that because the conceit of that is that, you know, the world has gone to hell and all the humans have become monsters. Similar hmm. to the one with Derek Jacobi and David Tennant where they found the master they had future kind mm. and they were just extras with like fangs and like kind of Mad Max punk so it's really funny to see how all those have come much have become much stronger yeah but like I don't know I'd love this era to just be a, about something it has its heart in the right place kind of in terms of some of the stories it's doing I don't know it, it, like it just, the it, last era had a like yeah like, look, you know, it just seems like they're pushing, they're, they're trying to be pushy and look and push things and agendas. Mm. And I'm like, look, fair enough, do that, but be good, you know, like, you know, <laughs> like, be you, good. Like, like, if, you, like, for example, Wally, Wally's brilliant, right? Wally pushes, it's all very political, you know, like, yeah. you know, don't trust big corporations, climate change, all that kind of stuff, right? Environmentalism, Environment, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's all fine, but you know what's more important? Movie is good. Yeah. I love Wally. I don't love Doctor Who. <laughs> yeah, you have to be entertaining first and have yeah. a nice message second. Exactly, like, I mean, you know? Funnily enough, I, I mean, thinking about Russell T. Davies and, like, kind of uh, Moffat, they had very particular ways of scripting. Like, Moffat would do an ideas draft and then a make sense of the ideas draft and then a joke draft. Even yeah. in the worst Moffat episodes, there was bound to be four or five absolute brilliant gags like and like you know that was kind of the aesthetic of that mixed with nightmares fairy tale stuff russell t davies was soap opera mixed with sci-fi which is very much his thing and it allowed the show to grow into america yeah yeah of course and like i mean i i struggle to think what is this era's kind of X factor, you know, like apart from obviously kind of the liberal stuff, which, you know, it's good to have it, but I don't, apart from maybe the idea of family in a very generic sense, like I kind of, and the other eras did that too anyways. But like, okay, okay. Well, here's where, here's where I'll draw the line on that, right? It's like, you have, you have like the pawns, for example, right? And you know what they're about yeah. and you know where they're going and you know the relationship they have with each other and the relationship they have with the doctor and you know when they get sent back in time it's mm. it's devastating, right? Yeah. There's nothing if they killed anyone in this in this season, you wouldn't care. You're like, okay, you know. I feel bad for Yaz, but more that'd be more out of like a sense of untapped potential than it would be out of yeah, but, like, but like no, that's that's not what I'm saying. Like obviously yeah, all these yeah. actors are great. I mean, like as a character, like you just yeah yeah not, i get you you, you yeah. just would not care hmm. you know there uh, we talked we talked about stakes you know with the with the dc and the marvel stuff you know it's like w- yeah. when you're what when you're watching when you're watching a movie like what's the reason to keep watching what's the, the care? like i'm watching um a show called upload at the moment on amazon prime hmm. it's not great it's well it's pretty good when it gets going it's actually quite decent and you start caring about the characters and stuff like that you know and it's like it's just basic writing. You should actually be invested in what's going on. And when modern Doctor Who, you're like, they just do stuff. And look, yeah. even, if, even if they weren't pushing agendas or anything like that, look, I don't care about that really. But I'm more just like, what was the point of the show? Like, what's the yeah? What, 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 why? Why did we? Why did we? I having spent two and a three years defending this era on the internet and putting my non-existent integrity on the line. What what was pardon me that was that's we're at fifty three. What was my effort spent on? And we will end on that grim question and pick up there next week. <laughs> okay, I just before we do, I have to say you know it's it's been a valiant move. I, I do respect that you are always able to see the good in it. But I'm you know here's the thing to the people in Doctor Who, you are broke, Keen's kind, gentle spirit. How dare you? 
How dare you? How dare you do it? He defended Look, you. I'll probably still enjoy the next series. I, <laughs> but you just I, won't defend it anymore. But you just won't defend it's, it anymore. <laughs> I, you know what? I won't defend it, but I'll, I'll also just move on from it. I, yeah, that's fair. See, there are people out there on the internet who are like, this killed the show. And to them, I say, the show has been killed multiple times in the past. Yeah. It will come back. Yeah. You know, it, I'll it will just, regenerate. I'll just kind of, yeah, 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 yeah. It'll be regenerate. I, I have high hopes because one of my favorite writers of the last series is being promoted to a bigger writing role in the next one. Again, the Villa Di Adati one. Mm. But at the same time, it feels more like this last season is making the most of a mixed bag. And that's not yeah. the strongest hand you want to go into a finale. I, I think I, the show, I'd like I think, to be proven wrong. The show, I think the show needs to find out what it is and want to find yeah. out. Like It's like Star Wars, right? Yeah, or any kind of property. If you don't fundamentally know, or even anything, yeah. you don't know who or what you are, how are you supposed to build something out of that? You exactly, know, yeah. and that's that's what, and that's my advice. I go, I give to anything in any in any capacity. Sort your own stuff out, and then go for it. If you're writing a property, figure out what it is, what you're trying to say, and yeah. what you're trying to achieve, and then write. Don't just you know go. Oh, we want to do all these things because it'll never happen. And you know that's that. I feel bad for Jodie Whittaker because yeah, it was groundbreaking. But everyone's going to be like, oh, they ever want to do that they again. finish audios, they'll, yeah. they'll snap up her contract straight yeah. away. There we go. Uh, it's like, yeah, I mean, you're actually, your Rise of Skywalker analogy is perfect for the last two years of Doctor Who. Because Moffat and the, and the Last Jedi are like, we're going to take risks and piss people off. And then we're just going to own it. And yeah. like, I get what people get upset. And this era is like the Rise of Skywalker, where we're going to please everyone. And then no one's going to be happy including the people from the last one like it's like uh it's to be fair it's not just chibnall's fault moffat made the aim to make doctor who more niche and chibnall has tried to win the general audience back and just lost the niche people so it's not entirely his fault but this is where we are you know yeah no that's fair that's fair and uh, you know we will you know if if people do have anything to add to that of course you know Leave a comment below. Uh, send us an email. We'd love to hear your thoughts on it because I know we kind of go back and forth with this. And, you know, we just want to say it is an audience show. Uh, Nair to know media at gmail.com is where you can reach us. And uh, it'd be Whitaker, cool to see you. If you're listening, we'd love to have you on. I, Absolutely. I, I love you guys. I'm sorry for being down. <laughs> Absolutely. I know, you know no one else is probably, but. Oh, uh, well. But anyway, yeah. sure. And on a happier note, Dara, is there anything you want to say or plug before we go? Um, go over to nerdtonomedia.com. Uh, check out all the shows that we have. If this is your first time listening to the show, welcome. What are you doing? Go over to nerdtonomedia. <laughs> check out all the shows. Um, and look, the listeners, the listenership has been going up. It's it's quite a lot. We do appreciate every single one of you. Um, and we're thankful that you guys still stick with us and uh, enjoy the content. The numbers are great. They really yeah. are keen. So, uh, you know, thank you to everybody who uh, joins in. But we want to hear from you. So, Go over to Nerdtonal Media, nerdtonalmedia at gmail.com. And also, uh, as I said, all the tech issues have been resolved, so we should be, should be back to being live really soon. We'll be live. Yep. Random opinions in real time. Yeah. And of course, that will be <laughs> on Wednesday at 9 p.m. So keep an eye on our social medias uh, for all that stuff. So nerdtonalmedia at gmail.com. It's where you can reach us. Nerdtonalmedia.com is where all our stuff is at. Lovely. Okay, well, I just want to say thank you to Dara and to everyone who's been listening. Thank you as well to Lucas for last week's show and indeed to next week's guest, who I will announce during the week on our socials. Um, if you want, as I said, if you want to find us, we're on Instagram, we're on Facebook, we're on Spotify, all those wonderful places. We have a wonderful backlog of crazy things to check out. But until then, I've been Kian, he's been Dara, and we will see you next oh, week. This Bye. Is we Bye. Work I, I, I. She says I'm not romantic. I say she's so dramatic. I tell her while we're at it, we can work it. I, I, I. She says I'm not romantic. I say she's so dramatic. Check out the Rest and Rewind here on Phoenix 92.5 FM every Tuesday at 8 p.m. to 9 p.m. And of course, over on NerdToKnowMedia.com, the only wrestling podcast by wrestling fans who don't hate wrestling. We'll see you then. Thank you for listening to a Nerd to Know Media production. <laughs>